government's proposed measures towards reopening the economy and building resilience. The Honorable Minister of Finance spent much time on government's response to the virus. In fact, the theme of the budget is resilience in the face of a global pandemic. Unlike other countries, for example, the United Kingdom, Trinidad and Tobago lost no time in taking decisive action and government was lauded for its efforts, at least in the early stages when we knew little about the virus. And the wisest course of action was better to be safe than to be sorry. But it seems to me that somewhere along the line, the powers that be have lost the plot. I particularly bemoan the over-reliance on vaccines, as though vaccination is the only magic bullet. Not long ago, in this very house, I asked the Honorable Minister of Health about ivermectin, a question he poo-pooed. But what's the harm with the Minister of Health or the Minister of Foreign Affairs checking with their counterparts in India, Africa, and elsewhere to see if there's any truth to the reports about ivermectin being used effectively against COVID in those countries. If it turns out that such claims are just fake news, government can report accordingly. But if it turns out that there is validity to those claims, then surely that must be good news. Surely because it gives us an additional weapon in the fight against COVID. Why the blind adherence to the WHO, especially when it is, there's potential for conflicts of interest due to the influence that WHO funders have on that organization? Why, when institutions like the WHO IMF and WTO, World Trade Organization, who are forever pontificating about the need for transparency and accountability. Was it necessary for the country to sign non-disclosure agreements? When the leader of the opposition asked the Minister of Health about these non-disclosure agreements, his response was that it's part of the standard negotiating process. Well, I don't accept that. I don't accept that response. Not after spending over US 18.1 million, or how much? This is after all of the gifted vaccines to us. Trinidad and Tobago, 123.1 million. 123.1 million of our general revenues on vaccines after these same institutions have committed another US 50 billion to deploy vaccines worldwide. In my experience, when big money is involved, companies prioritize profits over people. The argument that disclosure would harm the general public's prospects of obtaining vaccines by limiting the government's ability to negotiate effectively with pharmaceutical companies that just doesn't hold water with me. First, vaccines are a public health good. And secondly, as a matter of public interest, the public has a right to such information. Thirdly, and as I have said before, I don't see how publication of the vaccine contracts can prejudice government's ability to procure vaccines or harm the interests of the pharmaceutical companies. Transparency over contract details does not amount to the exposure of any trade or intellectual property secrets. Surely in a global crisis of this nature, we all want the same thing, to cure people as quickly as possible using all available means at our disposal. So why ignore ivermectin if it offers a fighting chance? What's the harm in investigating? 
why is WHO pushing governments all around the world to put all our eggs in the vaccination basket? And what recourse is there for those who have suffered or died from the vaccines? Will government accept responsibility? In the earlys when we didn't know much about the virus, closing our borders and imposing lockdowns made sense. But today, after having vaccinated hundreds of thousands, why are we still under a state of emergency? Why does the vaccine narrative keep changing? Why does the virus continue to spread and kill people? We were told that vaccines are the only solution. Then we heard that even though vaccinated, you could still get COVID, but the virus won't kill you. Now we're hearing that even vaccinated people can die from the virus. And that vaccines, all the vaccines are not equally effective. In some cases, boosters, the Minister of Health says not boosters, third shots may be required. The goalposts seem to keep shifting. Government has signaled in this budget that it will continue on the pathway to reopening our economy through a safe zone initiative. And I am perplexed. I am perplexed that while one can get immunity after being vaccinated with a weakened strain of the virus, apparently one doesn't acquire immunity after recovering from the virus. Why doesn't natural immunity count? Why do persons who have beaten the virus still need to be vaccinated? That doesn't make sense. Only the fully vaccinated and persons who have a medical exemption slash deferral certificate issued by a public medical officer are permitted on the premises of a safe zone. But if I am vaccinated and I am protected, why do I need to be in a safe zone? It seems to me that the people who most need protection are the unvaccinated. The notion of a safe zone sounds so alluring. But is this a case of good intentions, bad logic? Are we institutionalizing segregation? How long are these safe zones expected to last? Weeks? Months? Years? Indefinitely? COVID is not going away. We have to learn how to live with it. But I want to say this, that in responding to COVID and living with it, we must be very, very careful. We must be careful when restricting civil liberties and human movement, when creating new legal boundaries between exercising rights and breaking the law, when criminalizing ordinary conduct, such as going to the restaurant, the movies, the beach, and social events. We must be careful not to ostracize those who are unable or unwilling to be vaccinated. We must be careful not to institutionalize unequal treatment. We must be careful not to deny citizens the right to make voluntary medical decisions for themselves. Living with COVID may require us to continue wearing masks, to continue washing our hands and to continue social distancing. Vaccines have been on offer for those who choose not to be vaccinated, I say let them take responsibility for their own health and well-being. It's time for the state to step back. The need for a grand strategy and a shared unifying vision. The framers of this budget claim to offer a wide-ranging and broad-based response to the economic crisis and virus, including institutional building, digital transformation, safety and security, and social development. 
Lots of buzzwords and impressive sounding initiatives. But what I find lacking is a grand strategy and unifying vision. At the end of August, a friend of mine committed suicide. He was a strong man, a mentor to many, loved by all. Yet, he succumbed to depression brought on by the COVID restrictions <clears throat> and his inability to work, to interact with people, to do what he loved best. My heart breaks for his family and friends. And I wonder how many other people are similarly affected. How many have used their hard-earned and scarce life savings just to get by just to get by during this difficult and uncertain time? How many are experiencing feelings of low self-esteem, anxiety, fear, at the thought of being unable to provide for their loved ones? We are living in a state of uncertainty, and some have hit rock bottom, even while others appear to be doing well. We cannot be blind to this. People are trying to make sense of this budget to understand how it impacts them and wondering what the future holds. If ever there was a time for caring, a time for a competent and compassionate leadership, this is it. How we handle this moment will echo for generations. It will define who we are as a people and as a country. This is not a time for arrogance, bellicose language, and grandstanding. It is a time for healing, reorienting, and recalibrating. The failures of the current system have been thrown into stark relief by COVID. What's needed now, what's needed now are new ideas and a corresponding sense of purpose. What's needed are leaders with the right vision and perspective who are willing to listen. Leaders who can inspire us with a roadmap for the future. One that will get us to a good destination. But since the streets aren't numbered, we need groundbreaking leadership to get us to that good destination. If we hope to come out stronger and ready to face the future, we need to restructure the economy, and we need to change how we operate. Our leaders must be able to identify potential problems and try to resolve them before they reach a crisis point. A leader must be the voice of calm in a turbulent world. Our leaders must stop engaging in destructive behavior and petty squabbling. It's holding us back. At a time when people need to see, to hear clearly what needs to be done, all they're hearing is cacophony. We need leaders who will plant flowers instead of sowing the seeds of discord and policies that will leave people feeling uplifted. We are living in epoch changing times and must be alive to the moment. All of us here are privileged to be at the helm of this turning point. There is little difference between obstacle and opportunity. There are choices to make. Let's not miss the opportunities. If COVID has taught us anything, it is that our collective health and prosperity requires working together. Pandemic recovery spending gives us an opportunity if we have over US 7.1 billion in net reserves, part of that should be used for investing in our future. We should be bold and ambitious. Let's make our twin islands two of the best places to live on this planet. Smart cities, a healthy and thriving ecosystem with modern, sophisticated and integrated transport systems, harnessing renewable energy, new technologies, and meeting all of the sustainable development goals. The business as usual approach is no longer adequate. We need to design 
and invest in better education systems, workplaces, institutions, and infrastructure. If we can enable our citizens to live productive lives in a wholesome, safe, and green environment, everyone will benefit. I thank you.